Welcome to another edition of Market Sense, a webinar series presented by the BDO Trust Group, where we combine the latest market developments and analysis with seasoned expert advice to help you take control of your investments and grow your wealth. Today's session is entitled Exploring a World of Opportunities and will be moderated by the head of one of BDO's largest wealth and management centers. She has over 16 years of experience in wealth management, focusing on investment portfolio strategy. Let's welcome our moderator, Ms. Marie Diaz. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Marie Diaz. Welcome to the fifth episode of Market Sense. Now, as we all know, Philippine investments make up most of our portfolios for the longest time, and for very good reason. But for today, however, we would like to share with you how opening, up, opening ourselves up and overcoming our home bias can actually open up a world of opportunities for investors. For one, you have global equities, you have uh, high yield bonds, technology, the US, China. These are just some of the themes that we'll be talking about this afternoon. For one, first up, we have our uh, featured guests having a fireside chat about local and global market developments, uh, as well as market trends. Second, we have actionable portfolio investment insights that we can all execute, take advantage of these market trends. And lastly, and perhaps the most important part of this event is hearing from you, our dear clients. So again, if at any point you have any questions, please feel free to share them through the uh, chat box on your screen. Now, without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce our featured speakers. Our first speaker, is a multi-awarded seasoned investor. He is a two-time Asia Asset Management Philippines EIO of the Year awardee and a four-time recipient of the asset's most astute Philippine currency bond traders. He obtained his bachelor's degree at the University of the Philippines School of Economics with honors in 1990. And he completed his master's of science and economics at the Pennsylvania State University as a Rotary Foundation Ambassadorial Scholar in 1994. He was also a director of Deutsche Bank's Asset and Wealth Management Group in Manila for 18 years. Today, he helps oversee 1 trillion pesos in assets under management with the country's largest trust institution. Ladies and gentlemen, the Chief Investment Officer of BDO in Banking, Mr. Fritz Ocampo. Good afternoon, Marie. Good afternoon, Fritz. Our second guest is a longtime multi awarded investor who is also an independent director of BDO Unibank. He is the chairman of the bank's investment committee and trust committee. He also serves as an independent director of BDO Nomura Securities Inc. Since 2011, he has been the CEO and chief investment officer of his very own investment firm, RYS Investments Limited, which is based in Hong Kong. Prior to that, he spent 17 years as head of financials investment research for the Asia-Pacific business of the global investments giant, global, uh, global, Goldman Sachs, rather. His team for seven years ranked number one in the institu institutional investors in Asia money uh, research polls. At the age of 40, very early, he became the first Filipino to lead Goldman Sachs Asia and later on become one of the most influential financial analysts in the region. Just how influential is Director Roy in global investments? Now, unknown to many, in the early 2000s, he worked, he worked on the reform of banks and IPOs in mainland China. In 2020, when AIA debuted in the Hong Kong Stock Exchange, he pushed for the stock as a top pick and as we all know, it became the third largest IPO globally. Earlier during the financial crisis, he actually wrote a piece exposing a major weakness in Korean businesses who were posting, posting profits and yet were oper operationally losing money. And as a result, actually resulted in huge amount of debt for these companies. And later on, as we all know, it boiled into the Korean financial crisis. He graduated cum laude with a degree in business administration and accountancy from the University of the Philippines. He also has a master's in business degree 
from Wharton School, University of Pennsylvania. Ladies and gentlemen, let us all welcome our second guest, the seasoned Asian financials analyst and global investor, BDO's independent director, Mr. Roy Ramos. Thank you, Marie, and good, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon again, Fritz and Director Roy. Thank you very much again for joining us this afternoon. Our clients and our audience are very much excited to hear of your discussion today. So can without I just, further ado, I can, will can leave you with sure Director Roy. Can I just make sure that you're hearing me well? Yes, uh, we hear you loud and clear, Director Roy. Thank you. Okay. Yes, Fritz, uh, take it away and I'll catch up with you later. Thank you, Marie. Good afternoon to Hello, everyone. Friends. Roy, good afternoon. Hello. We're so excited to have you on Market Sense. The number of our uh, clients as well as uh, friends who have registered and are currently here with us uh, reflects the interest in the subject matter and, of course, in our speaker. Roy, you clearly had much success in uh, global capital markets. Uh, as mentioned by Marie, rising to become managing director and partner at Goldman Sachs, the only Filipino to do so at the age of 40. Uh, I think back then at age 40, I was still uh, playing basketball. <laughs> uh, when did you know that you wanted to be involved in uh, the capital markets? Uh, well, I always liked investing in stocks, particularly tech. I think the very first stock I bought was Sony. The very first stock that I doubled or tripled my money was a company called Delrina, uh, which for the oldies amongst us, uh, created a software for the PC where you could fax uh, documents from your PC. Uh, it's a Canadian company. I, I couldn't uh, look it up from the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, and share price. I had to walk 10 blocks in New York City just to get a newsstand that had a Canadian newspaper. And the fact that I did that almost once a week or maybe even twice a week, I was like, oh, my God, I'm really into uh, investing in stocks. So I got my break in 1994. Goldman was looking for an Asian banks analyst. I knew the Japanese analyst. I applied for the job. I was lucky enough to get the job, and that's what started me. Now, the, the only other thing I'll say is that initially I wanted to do tech, but tech at that point was very sm a very small sector in Asia, and they really were looking for a banks analyst. So I ended up becoming a banks analyst, and that was the story of my life or career at Goldman for 17 years. Well, we'll go in more detail to what you've just mentioned, but right now, uh, where have you been during the last seven months for uh, most people, when the government says uh, stay at home, we literally go home and, and uh, stay at home. Uh, but for Roy, that's very difficult because he literally lives in uh, four different countries. So where have you been during the last seven months? Well, like most everybody else, uh, we have been stuck, uh, but fortunately uh, since March. But fortunately, we've been stuck in Taiwan. The reason for Taiwan is because my wife is Taiwanese and we have a place in Taiwan and she has a big family here. So I say fortunately, because uh, Taiwan has been fairly COVID free. Eh? Uh, and we right. don't know why, but it's been fairly COVID free. But anyway, we've been here. I, I, we're hoping to get back to Hong Kong uh, sometime next month, but uh, there's still more cases and there's a lot of quarantining requirements, obviously. And how has <laughs> Taiwan been able to manage the infection rate? Uh, of COVID-19. Yeah, and, and it's kind of weird that parang surreal, it's surreal na, it's, na life is normal here. Eh? But if the correct question is how, how, why, why? I, I guess the short answer is that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And in, uh, I would say four or five things in the case of Taiwan. And I think this has, uh, this has implications going forward no? on the premise that we will still have more pandemics going forward, no? Uh, number one, they were very alert and vigilant, and they had no choice, no, because you know they're not part of the WHO. You know they have hardly any diplomatic relationships, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So they were all, always alert and vigilant. Two, uh, they were very early in spotting on new coronavirus in Wuhan, and they, they were so fast in terms of uh, restricting flights or testing everyone that came in from Wuhan. And then that the expanded to all of China and then basically expanded to all of the world. So uh, second component, I think, was very uh, fast and decisive in acting. 
Third component, I think, is uh, leadership from the very top, you know, starting with Tsai Ing-wen, the president. Fourth component was cooperation amongst the cities and the municipalities. So it was a very tight uh, uh, relationship between or coordination between the national government and the, and the cities. And then fifth and most importantly also is human cooperation, the trust and cooperation of citizens. If I may know, I'll just give you an example. We flew in from the US, San Francisco, uh, back in March. Uh, at that point, the US was still safe, so to speak. But people thought that we flew in as usual from Hong Kong. And then within two hours, uh, people had reported us to the municipality as why we were not quarantining. And within two hours, we got a call from the municipality saying, why are you not quarantining? And then we had to explain that we came in from San Francisco, which at that point was considered safe. Now, the, during the two-week quarantine, soft quarantine period that we had in Taipei, every day, we would get a call on our landline just to make sure that we were at home. And every day we would also get SMS that you had to respond to right away. Uh, so, you know, um, the execution, the follow through and all of that, uh, plus also the tech tools and then the contact tracing and all of that. So I think those are some of the things that made Taiwan be able to, you know, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, so to speak. Right. It's good to hear that you're, uh very safe uh, and definitely healthy in, in no. Taiwan. But Fritz, may I just say, no, uh, it, it's okay, so Taiwan is safe. There's hardly any COVID cases, but then it's completely sealed off. But that cannot continue, especially Taiwan is at the center of tech. At some point, they will have to open up. But when they open up, there's no such thing as herd immunity here. So, you know, this, this brings up the question of vaccines or antiviral treatments, which we can get into if you want. Right. right. Talking about vaccines, uh, the good news uh, with all of this is that uh, vaccine development is uh, proceeding at an unprecedented yes. speed. Yes. About 175 institutions now are involved in vaccine development. Eight are in phase three. Yes. Uh, and, and there's more, a lot of hope. Uh, do you think that the announcement of a, the discovery of a COVID vaccine could uh, boost investor sentiment and trigger an equity market recovery in Asia, especially in ASEAN? Short answer, yes to both questions. A little bit longer answer. Mm -hmm. I think it's been scientifically established that the presence of antibodies uh, will help you not uh, get totally infected or you get infected as a minor infection and then your antibodies uh, fight it. Uh, there was one, uh, if I may not, for 10 seconds or 20 seconds, there was one ship that sailed from Seattle back in May, fishing uh, vessel, uh, you know, uh, to, to fish. Uh, there were hun like 123 people on the ship. They all got tested first you know, for PCR uh, against the COVID, uh, and no one tested positive, but they must have missed someone because when the ship came back, uh, like 103 got infected with coronavirus. So, so there was somebody on board that had it. But there were also three people on board that had the antibodies before the ship sailed. And all three came back without any coronavirus. So again, it's, an, parang it's a circumstantial evidence that if you have the antibodies, you, then you have a lot more fighting chance against the coronavirus. And then what's also been scientifically established with the trial so far is that uh, the vaccines do produce the antibodies that are necessary. So, you know, uh, I, I, again, I think, as you said, there's so many vaccines under development. In my sense is that we will have, say, F Pfizer, BioNTech, or Moderna, uh, you know, uh, finishing up with their phase three trials by end of this month or early November, middle of November. So, you know, hopefully we will start having mass dissemination of vaccines uh, in, uh, in um, you know, Feb, March, something like that. Yes, yes. but uh, the truth will, is that uh, the vaccine will be available in developed markets like yes. the U.S. and Europe yeah. ahead of emerging yeah. markets, especially poorer countries like the Philippines. Yes. What can the Philippines do to ensure that the vaccine becomes available for the vast population at an affordable price? A very good question, Fritz. I'll answer two or three ways. Number one, 
the Philippines should obviously secure e either the government, obviously the government, but also maybe some of the private sector, private sector foundations, uh, SM, BDO, Ayala, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, the, collectively, the Philippines should ensure, should come up with advanced purchase commitments or uh, agreements and all of that. And there's a whole slew of vaccine developers to, to go to. Second, um, some of the vaccines are relatively uh, uh, reasonably priced. And then look at the Philippines, huh? let's say 100 million people. Maybe you, you need to vaccinate 70 million people. Uh, make it for free. I mean, India has committed just a couple of days ago to making vaccines available for everyone for free in India. Um, and the U.S. also has uh, committed to doing so. Uh, you look, go, going back to the Philippines, say, let's say 70 million people need to get vaccinated. Uh, take a look at the AstraZeneca vaccine, uh, assuming it passes. That's supposed to be sold at like uh, $6 per shot. And uh, maybe you need two shots, so that's $12. So 70 million times $12, that'll be 840 million. That, that's an 840 million US dollar expenditure, but that's to save or to make sure that the $350 billion economy continues to function uh, without lockdowns and all of that. I mean, 700, uh, 840 divided by three, uh, 350 billion, that's only 0.25% of GDP. It is well worth the investment and it's well worth it for the government or private sector foundations to distribute it for free to, to essentially the whole population. Yes, definitely. Uh, we have to move uh, as early as now in order to access the yes. vaccine as soon as yeah. it comes out, or at least a few months later. Yeah. Uh, in your previous life, as mentioned by Marie, you were a top ranked banking analyst, uh, number one in, in, in Asia for many years. And unknown to the public, Roy made accurate calls on the Thai banking industry, warning of an impending crisis and the rise of non-performing loans uh, in the Asia-Pacific region prior to the Asian financial crisis of 1997. Uh, I recall, I, I saw the article, Roy, and you know uh, there was a lot of uh, debate what you were talking about, but in the end, you were proven to be correct. What is your view on Asian banks this time around? Um, difficult, but do we get the crisis? Probably, I don't think so. Probably not. The, the, we could get the crisis, and I can talk about how we didn't go crisis, a financial crisis. No, uh, this time is similar in that, of course, you will have more NPLs for the banks, uh, and the longer this pandemic, and the longer the you know some kind of lockdowns persist, the more the damage, and inevitably the banks end up absorbing quite a bit of the damage or losses, because that's where the money is. The, the banks have the money, so to speak, and the banks have lent out money. You know. But at the same time, Fritz, uh, this time is also very different in that you didn't have any, you didn't have much by way of financial excesses or systemic vulnerabilities. I mean, if you look at the Asia banking crisis, the global financial crisis, that was caused by the banks, by uh, abusive or excessive behavior by the banks, and partly also the government. You know, you had pegged currencies, and you had a lot of FX borrowings by bo both government as well as by uh, private companies. You don't have that right now. Now, as they say, it's the sudden stop that kills. But both now and before, with the GFC and the uh, Asian banking crisis, you had a sudden stop. Um, so, in a way, I guess the problem is in a way worse now nah, because of the sudden stop. You know, I, if you have prolonged lockdowns, you don't even have any EBITDA. A good, right. way to, a good way of measuring whether a company becomes an NPL is just looking at EBITDA, earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, amortization. That's cash earnings, basically. Uh, if, if interest expense is more than EBITDA, then you're kind of an implied NPL. Uh, now, I mean, interest rates are so low, so interest expense is not really an issue. But then if, if you have complete lockdown, then how can you have EBITDA to begin with? So that right, is right. essentially the issue now. Uh, so again, 
you know, in a way, we just have to cope with the virus and the pandemic as best as we can, but we cannot afford to be locked down forever. And that's where the vaccines and also the antiviral treatments, you know, better pro treatment protocols come in. But we, you know, I'm, I'm optimistic on that front. My follow up question, Roy, is yeah. can the global economic recession spiral into a financial crisis? Uh, yes, uh, but you know, it, several things have to happen for that to happen. No? Number one, you have a prolonged virus, and you maybe have a mutation in the virus so that the vaccines that have been developed are not effective against it. But more importantly, you have prolonged lockdowns again because people start panicking again and governments start panicking again, all of that. So again, it just boils down to if you have you know, prolonged lockdowns and people don't feel safe. People don't go out to watch a movie, eat in restaurants and companies don't expand. So it all boils down to government's uh, fiscal stimulus or emergency, uh, emergency cash allowances, et cetera, et cetera. The good thing about the Philippines, as you know, you, you know better than me, is that there's a lot of fiscal room. I mean, the, the government the debt to GDP of the Philippines is still very low at 50 or 60% versus uh, the US at 120, Japan at 200%, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, th there's at least more uh, ample cushion in the case of the Philippines. Let's now uh, pivot, Roy, uh, if yeah. you would, uh, in, into the, the realm of investments. Post Goldman Sachs, uh, Roy evolved from a Pan-Asian investor to a global investor is RYNS fund, uh, which is, by the way, not available in the Philippines, but I'd like to discuss it just to, to get into the uh, mindset of Roy, um, gained 19% over the past five years and 22% over the past three years, uh, clearly beating the benchmark uh, S&P 500 index. Uh, is your fund purely an equity fund or a multi-asset fund, Roy? Uh, short answer, it's a multi-asset fund, but longer answer is that uh, it's mostly equity and it's mostly uh, tech. And in the case of tech, it's mostly U.S., uh, China, Taiwan, and a little bit of Europe. Um, uh, I guess what I'll say is that the, I mean, I do mean with the fund maintains a fairly a significant portion of cash, 20%. And that's intentional man, because we live in very uncertain, volatile times. So, you know, a, a lot of bad things can happen. So it's, it pays to have cash and pays to be able to redeploy the cash uh, as and when bad things. Uh, so in, in, in selecting stocks, Roy, uh, yeah. on the equity allocation side, yeah. wh what is your major consideration uh, do you look at growth or value? Uh, short answer is growth. But can I, can I just continue and say, so 20% cash and then about 8% bonds, which are giving a yield of, call it about 7% or 8% on you know, China developer bonds. And so far, so good. No, but it's shrunk a lot because the problem now is that bond yields are so low. So it's so hard right. to get the uh, bond uh, with a decent yield there. Uh, and then uh, about 8% of the fund is in dividend yield stocks. And that's been an unmitigated disaster. I mean, these are like Hong Kong banks, uh, Australian banks, uh, REITs and all of that. that. That portion of the portfolio is down like 35%. I mean, my HSBC shares are down 53% on cost basis, blah, 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 blah. So right, right. it hasn't worked out. But then the, the biggest part, 65% is uh, equities, and it tends to be mostly U.S., uh, uh, and a little bit of uh, China, a little bit of Europe, and uh, the big chunk of it is uh, tech. Why tech? Well, we can get into that, but uh, I, I mean, at the end of the day, equity investing, the best kind of equity investing, I think, is about growth. And the best kind of growth, or some of the best growth you can get from uh, innovative, disruptive uh, technology. Uh, Fritz, you just put on a slide here. Again, it's all about growth. If I may say, not the future, as, as quoted by a science fiction writer, William Gibson, the future is already here. It's just not very evenly distributed. And that's certainly the case with the Philippines. And there's hardly any Tesla battery powered electric cars in the Philippines. Or there's not much by way of renewables yet, although I guess you're getting more and more solar now. 
but I mean, it's there already. And I mean, there are some data centers at Apple or Google that are almost 100% powered by renewables, for instance. Uh, and then te te uh, electric cars are so much easier to maintain. You don't have to change spark plugs. You don't have to change engine oil, transmission fluid, blah, 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 blah. And then the a second one, uh, Steve Jobs actually quoted Wayne, Wayne Gritsky, the, one of the legendary yeah. hockey players. Player. I speak to where the puck is going to be, not where it has been. And that's the point about tech, uh, you, getting more and more tech advances. And yeah, it, you know, that brings up all kinds of disruptive uh, new opportunities, et cetera, et cetera. You, you, you mentioned that you have always uh, focused on, on tech. And, and definitely tech has led the recovery of global equity markets, um, clearly from the March lows to, to where it is today. Um, tech has outperformed major indices for a while now. Um, do you think that the tech sector now trading at lofty valuations is a bubble about to burst? A short answer, no. I don't think so. I think, yeah, we'll get corrections, no? We'll have volatility, we'll have corrections, but I would use the volatility and I would use the corrections to actually start positions or add to positions. And that's exactly what I have been doing. Now, the question is why, why do I have so much conviction in tech? Maybe if you can go to the next slide. Um, You've had accelerating tech advances, each building on top of prior advances, no. But at the same time, before I talk about this, the, pro the, the situation also is that interest rates are so low, eh? bond yields are so low. It, uh, I'm, I'm going to get a little bit technical here, but uh, if, you look, if you do discounted cash flow or dividend discount model, the cost of equity, uh, you know, which is based off the bond yield, can really make a huge difference for the PE of, uh, of a company or the PE of a stock market. Eh? Uh, the US S&P is trading right now at about 20 times earnings now. Microsoft, everybody knows Microsoft, everybody uses Microsoft now, is trading at 29 times earnings. Now, if you run it through a dividend discount model and you put in a cost of equity, of call it 5%, and then you make assumptions about growth, call it 15% growth in the first three or five years, and then 6% terminal growth. You can easily justify a 29 times multiple. On the other hand, though, if the cost of equity goes up from 5% to 7%, all of a sudden that fair PE of 29 times mathematically goes down to 17 times. So number one, you have to be so cognizant of what will happen to interest rates, bond yields. I'm of the view that we are forever in a low uh, bond yield environment. Maybe, yeah, maybe it'll go back up to 150, but it's not going to 1.5% 10 year US Treasury, but it's not going to go to, it's not going to go back to 5% in my opinion. Now, if I'm wrong, then I'll be very wrong in terms of uh, being very heavily invested in tech. And then so you know, I can talk about some tech advances. Uh, Sorry. So Roy, you're a believer in Tina. There is no other alternative. Yes, yeah. But, but equities, given the historically low uh, bond yields that we're seeing globally and locally. Yeah. And again, I, I would make the point, so there's the valuation or the low interest rate reason. But more importantly, there's the fundamental, the more fundamental reason is that uh, the, the tech advances will continue. Eh? And they, they, if anything, they're accelerating and they're building on top of uh, prior tech advances. I mean, for instance, if we take a look at the, an iPhone, which I'm holding on right now, iPhone 11. I, I mean, this is, a, this is a piece of magic in a way. The, the chip that's in it, 0.5 billion transistors on a chip that's the size of a fingernail. I mean, imagine that, you know, 8.5 billion transistors. You have a supercomputer in your product. But what made this possible was number one, electricity, Number two, materials advances, battery advances. Number three, uh, 3G, 4G, 5G, Wi-Fi, you know, uh, mastery of radio frequencies. Uh, number four, you know, the technology to, to make such, you know, small chips with such so powerful small chips and all of that. You, you know, so, you know, th this iPhone would not be possible without all of the advances that, uh, that 
But at the same time, the iPhone's been disrupted. You don't need a camera anymore. You don't need a calculator. You don't need a voice recorder. You don't need a CD player. You don't, you don't even need a TV anymore. You can stream Netflix on it. Uh, and it has built so many huge businesses on back of it. You know, Facebook, uh, TikTok, uh, Tencent, uh, Ali, Alibaba, blah, 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 blah. So, you know, just, and we're just talking about one single, one uh, single product. Uh, single product. Yeah. Uh, wh when you mention tech, however, uh, tech involves a lot of niche markets. Uh, what types of tech formats do you look at? Do you look at payment mechanisms, uh, new world of internet, online retail shopping? Uh, what 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 are you focused on? Uh, short answer is basically all of what you said, and yeah, I, I, I made this slide. No, I can think of at least nine uh, themes within tech that uh, will that have been uh, developing. Number one. And that too is still early days. So you're still going to see a lot more over the next 10 years. Uh, and then, so uh, I'm talking about cloud computing, software as a service, big data, artificial intelligence, digitalization of commerce, uh, digitalization of media and streaming, you know, like Netflix, Spotify, digitalization of cash and finance, like PayPal, MasterCard, Visa. Uh, digitalization of work processes, uh, Adobe, you know, for the arts, Autodesk for, you know, creating buildings or projects and all of that. And then you get into the biotech world, uh, gene sequencing, precision medicine, uh, Illumina, CRISPR, uh, renewable energy. People may not know this, but next energy, uh, next era energy in the U.S. Uh, is the biggest renewables. And as I said, market cap that's even bigger now than Exxon. Once upon a time in the world, the uh, Exxon was the biggest market cap company in the world. And now, you know, renewable companies is uh, even bigger than that. And then what I did here, Fritz, was for each of those nine themes, I put in place uh, uh, representative companies that ride or create or drive that theme. And then uh, underneath each, uh, each of the names, I put the total returns, not annualized, no? But total returns over the past five years, if you had held any of those stocks for the past five years. And uh, I think that will continue. And the good thing also is, even for a lot of Filipinos, is that you're very familiar with this name. This name. Everybody knows Amazon, everybody knows Microsoft, everybody That's knows what Netflix. I was about to say, yeah. Looking at this slide, uh, yeah. the, the companies that you listed. Are now all uh, household familiar names. Yes. Yeah. They have really permeated our lives, either at, yes. at our homes or in the yeah. office. Uh, who Correct. doesn't know Google by now? Who doesn't know Adobe exactly. by now? Uh, yeah. Who's Correct. not familiar with PayPal? You know, and and I, I guess this is your your strategy that you're looking at growth uh, on the goods and services being offered to to the market or to the customer, and you try right. to. To look how, how far this company will grow. Yes. Yeah. In a way, for, again, for the oldies amongst us, now, and Fritz, maybe <laughs> maybe you're not as old as as me. No. But uh, my point is, it, 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 some of you may remember Peter Lynch, uh, Fidelity Magellan Definitely. Fund, and he had a great book An called of Wall Street. Uh, yeah, one up on Wall Street. The point, but the point is, if you have a tech and you love the product, your kids love the product, and you know it's going to do much, much more going forward, chances are you just buy the stock and it'll be a very good investment to hold the and It becomes a 10-bagger, you know, five-bagger, 10-bagger. Uh, I mean, some of these names, are, I mean, Microsoft has been a, like a 1,000-bagger. Apple has been a 1,000-bagger, so, so to speak. But at the same time, Fritz, some of these names are new, no? Maybe not a lot of people know about Shopify, but it's up 3,000% in just the past five years. Some of you may not know about Illumina or next era energy. So, you know, I, it's also good to invest in some of the new upcoming I'm names sorry. because you get more upside on it. Right. Now, let, let's try to move away from technology. Um, other themes in, in global investing would be ESG or environmental, social, and, and governance, um, yeah. climate change, healthcare, uh, and security. In all of yeah. its forms, uh, yeah. security for banks, anti-hacking devices, uh, physical security for states. Um, yes. Are these themes 
sustainable for the next decade? Do you even look at them right now as an investor? Short answer, yes. And can, can we switch back to that last slide with the in themes, the tech, tech themes? Uh, you can see CrowdStrike. That's considered the best, uh, and it's software, it's the best for security, as an example, uh, you know, cybersecurity. That's figured in the Hillary Clinton emails and the Trump Ukraine, <laughs> all of that. But it's supposed to be the best of the best when it comes to endpoint security. In fact, I think even BDO Unibank uses the CrowdStrike for endpoint, you know, PCs and all of that. Then you look at next era energy. Again, this is solar and wind. It's the biggest in the US. It's got the best track record. Uh, it has a five or 10 year lead track record. It's up 236% in the past five years. And again, it's bigger market cap now than Exxon. Uh, uh, and then Fritz to your question, especially if you get Biden as the next president, if you get him, he's, that is fully committed to uh, transitioning the U.S. to renewables. And it makes sense, no? Renewables at the end of the day is free energy. It's just a matter of harnessing it. And it's green. You have a lot less emissions. And electric cars, once you get used to an electric car, and if you have the charging infrastructure, you really don't want to go back to the age of ice, the old age of ice uh, internal combustion engines, because it, it's so much easier to maintain it. Uh, we have a Tesla in California. After one year, you know, out of force of habit, I, I, I set up a maintenance schedule with Tesla, and they called me back. And actually, said you don't need to call, call us back in two years. Right, climate change and uh, clean energy were definitely uh, discussed during the debate uh, this yeah. morning, Asia yeah. time. And yes. uh, you see that uh, candidate Biden uh, is well versed in the subject matter. Yes, uh, and, and clearly he has done his homework there. Um, Chris, may I just well, say on, on healthcare? Yes, it's a great theme, especially biotech. No, right, uh, right. Can, can we again go back to the slide before? Illumina is like the Intel or the TSMC Taiwan Semiconductor of gene sequencing. They make 90% of all of the gene sequencing machines. And then CRISPR which is up a lot, no? up 685% in the past five years. That is the, you know, that is the innovator for gene editing. So if you realize that you have a gene uh, or that makes you susceptible to Alzheimer's, theoretically they can edit that gene out. So you, you have less risk of getting Alzheimer's. But I guess, for me, no, I may, maybe for most people, unless you, have, you really are a biologist or biotech, it's very hard to figure out who's going to, it's almost like investing in sweepstakes, eh? because you, you have all these trials, you don't know if it's okay. going to pop out. So the process in a way, to, have, to have something approved yes. uh, takes a while. So in a way, you, you need to rely on really professionals. So yes, I'm invested in tech, and so in biotech. But I do it mostly through uh, professional managers, and in particular, I do it through ARC, ARC investments. And we can okay, talk before about we go too. there. Uh, yeah. Okay, you've already widened our perspective talking about technology and global investments. Um, exchange traded funds have grown yes. exponentially over the past two decades. Right. Uh, debunking active management as an investment style. Uh, my question, Roy, is for novice investors, uh, would you recommend passive investing via in ETFs index funds as a first step to get their feet wet? Uh, the way I would answer is if you really know a company and you're confident about it, uh, you have conviction in it, uh, and you think it will continue to grow, and will continue to surprise on growth, then by all means buy it now. But uh, people usually lose money when they invest in stuff that they don't understand uh, or exactly. that they don't really follow. No? Uh, but, but the U.S. market in particular is, I mean, the U.S. is one of the most, is the most competitive, uh, you know, corporates in the world. When you buy a U.S. company, you're not buying U.S. GDP growth. 
you're not buying into all of the divisiveness of uh, Democrats versus Republicans. I mean, a lot of S&P 500 or S&P 100 companies are global leaders that, that you know, sell, manufacture, source from the entire world, maybe less from China these days now, or less going forward in China. But, but so it, in a way, it makes sense to be in the S&P 500 uh, ETFs. I know I linked, I know I put in one here, which is uh, managed by State Street, it's the biggest one, SPY. And if you look at the returns, the annual, uh, this is total returns now, one year, three years, five years, 10 years. It's not bad. It's better than yep, PCOM. Yep, definitely. Uh, definitely. And it's in dollar. And presumably, you have a lot of people here who want to send their kids to study in the US, so they will need some dollar funds. Now, so it makes sense to be an SPY. It even makes more sense to be in U.S. tech because it's that's higher growth. So I put in here one of the biggest four, the Nasdaq 100, which is QQQ. And again, in, in 10 years, you would have done 520 percent. And then I think going forward, especially it's it's done less. No, uh, the China tech. The, I'm putting CQQQ, which is uh, also administered or managed by Investco. That's up 191 percent in the past 10 years. But I think given the U.S. versus China thing, China is gonna, has no choice but to develop its own tech industry. So I think that's also, that's also a good one to invest in going forward. And again, an advantage of ETF is, well, two advantages. Number one, you don't have to know all the companies. No? You, you, just, you just have faith in, in U.S. companies or in China tech companies. And then number two, you can be in and out because this is just, you know, you can buy through BDO Unibank or some other broker. And then if you want to be out, you can be out in, in 10 minutes. So this and they're cheap. they're cheap. They're cheap too. Yeah. In terms of the management fees. Yeah. Right. Uh, these are all ETFs or exchange traded funds linked to a specific index. In this case, the S&P 500 or the NASDAQ which everybody sees on, on TV, on CNN or uh, Bloomberg. Um, are there actively managed ETFs in the market? Uh, short answer, yes. And there are increasingly more. Obviously, you only want to invest in them if they will generate alpha. In other words, if they will do better than the index. That so they I'll perform the index. I'll, I'll perform. You don't want to, yeah, but yes, and in particular, I, I would highlight uh, the ETFs that are managed and sold by ARK Investments, which is based in New York. They're actively managed, but they're in the form of ETF. So you can buy it like, just like you would buy stock in Microsoft, uh, and then you can be in and out if you want to. But actually, I think they make sense to be uh, long term, you know, buy and just hold it forever kind of uh, situations. Now, why am I highlighting this? Um, three reasons. Number one, when I was at Goldman, I knew the founder uh, of this uh, uh, and uh, the chief investment officer of this company. It's a, it's a woman, Kathy Woods. Uh, the number two, uh, I don't have any vested interest in it other than, the, I, I mean, all of these funds, uh, I mean, all of these ETFs here now, and if you combine them, it's probably my number two or number three largest holding. So I do, I do have conviction in them. And number three, most importantly, they've done so well. If you will see the, the flagship fund has done 441% since its inception in 2014. They have one for genomics for the biotech, and that's up 300% since 2014. They have one that's focused on next generation internet, um, you know, things like Square or Alibaba, uh, and that's up almost 600%. Uh, and then they have uh, uh, one focus on fintech that's been around since 2019, and that's been a double since then. Okay. And by the way, and all of these uh, kind of something like 70 basis point management fee, so it's okay. uh, relatively re no, it's not it's not a hedge fund. No, it's not your two percent, twenty percent uh, cut. It's just a 70 basis, 80 basis point kind of management fee. And, and we discuss this these funds not because they're BDO funds or they are your funds, but just because that they're out there yes. in the global arena, in the universe of investments outside. And, and I, my next question is, what are some big ideas of, of ARC um, that has allowed it to outperform uh, even the, the benchmarks? Well, one, uh, uh, to, 
fits to your question you know, uh, as an aside, one of the nice things also about ARC is that they're so open. They, they will publish almost every, I think every week or every, um, yeah, or, or, or if not daily, they will publish all of the holdings uh, in each of their funds, number one. Number two, they have a lot of research that again, they freely uh, disseminate uh, through their website. Every year they come up with uh, their big ideas, um, um, big report. And the one in, this is, I'm showing the one that was done this year. And they have, uh, again, 11 big ideas, some of which you already touched on, like streaming media, electric, electronic vehicles, automation, 3D printing, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And we, we can talk, some of them are quite uh, controversial or still highly debated, like Bitcoin. Uh, their biggest holding in a lot of their funds is Tesla. And Tesla, some people think of as so ridiculously overvalued, but they've been in it big time for a long time and they've been right on it. And it's one of their heaviest picks. Yes. Uh, and, and first, I think you're in some of the ARC funds yourself now. I mean, for a while, I couldn't invest in Tesla myself because I said, you know, it's so volatile and so expensive. So I, but I'm investing in it through. Uh, I was investing in it anyway through art, but uh, having looked more at Tesla, I think Tesla is the but electric cars are going to be the future. And I think people, most people, including professional analysts and professional investors, underestimate the earnings power and the growth power of Tesla going forward. So I'm in the stock yeah. myself now. Very good. Uh, believe it or not. We've been talking now for 50 minutes, uh, Roy, and, and I need to wrap up. I, I just need to ask you two more questions. One is on the U.S.-China tensions, which are reemerging with the U.S. elections and uh, with respect to the blame game of who is to blame with the spread of COVID-19 or the, the trade tensions or even the removal of SAR status in Hong Kong. My question is, what is the underlying issue between the U.S. and China? Is it is it simply the trade deficit, or is it to battle for technology supremacy in the world? Uh, can we uh, move to the next slide? Uh, I showed here two books now. The first one, the one on the right, Xi Jinping, the backlash. I think there's been a backlash on China as it has become more and more. Uh, powerful and assertive, and especially after coronavirus. No? Some people blame it for having concealed, et cetera, et cetera. And some people also were so upset with how China was uh, bragging about how well it controlled COVID and yeah, they would donate masks and all of that, but then they wanted a public thank you, et cetera, et cetera. So number one, there's been more and more backlash against China. But number two, and more fundamentally, this this book uh, came out that kind of encapsulates the what I think is the biggest fundamental challenge that the world faces going forward, which is that you have a existing superpower, but then you also have uh, an up and rising power, uh, and then there's the question of how this evolves. You no, know? and what this guy did, he was the founding dean of the Harvard Kennedy School of Government, he calls it the Thucydides uh, trap. But when you have a rising power uh, that challenges the, the 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 current power, in most cases they end up in war. He he profiled sixteen sorry, eighteen cases, twelve of which ended up in hot wars, and six of which ended up in more like a cold war or tensions, but not a real hot war. You know, for instance, U.S. versus versus Russia or. U.S. versus U.K. or U.S. versus, uh, I'm sorry, U.K. versus Germany. So, uh, and as you, and first, as you mentioned, uh, it's not just about trade anymore. It's a lot, a lot of things so on the right side, an increasing level of disputes with South China Sea, uh, the ch supply chain over dependence on China, Huawei, SMIC, intellectual property theft, uh, Chinese students in U.S. Uh, medical or tech programs. U.S. journalists in China and vice versa, closure of consulates, uh, you know, take, uh, uh, banning WeChat, TikTok, and group, just like uh, China bans Google or Facebook in, in China. And then, you know, the issue of Hong Kong SAR, the issue of uh, Xinjiang or the Uyghurs, or, or et cetera, et cetera. 
So I think, personally, I think this was one of the biggest challenges that the world faces going forward. Hopefully, it will be a cold war as opposed to a hot war. But there's also the issue of Taiwan, and uh, some people think that uh, uh, China is dead set on controlling Taiwan by 2049, 2049 being the 100th anniversary of the People's Republic of China. You know, the question is, if that happens, you know, or it happens 20 years before that, uh, what will the U.S. do and how will, uh, uh, how will other countries uh, react? My final question, and um, I just need to ask this, uh, because uh, the U.S. elections is less than two weeks away, and we had uh, the final debate this morning, Asian time. Whoever wins will have a tough task containing uh, the continued spread of COVID-19 in the U.S. and in the world, and steering the world out of a its worst global recession. Um, my question, does a Biden victory or even the so-called blue wave, meaning a landslide Democrat victory of uh, both houses and the White House, mean more taxes in the U.S. and probably a pullback of Wall Street? The short answer is yes to both. Uh, a Biden victory will mean more taxes. It may also mean a little bit of a pullback in Wall Street, especially for the high-valued uh, tech stocks, you know, which uh, should be affected by uh, tax hikes. You know? But the longer answer is that, uh, number one, uh, the taxes will be small compared to the fiscal stimulus. I mean, Biden and Democrats are talking about one trillion or two trillion of fiscal stimulus in in 2021. They're talking about taxes, but the total taxes will be like uh, maybe 200 billion, assuming it gets implemented in 2021. Maybe it'll be 2022 before it gets implemented. No. So on the one hand, there will be a fiscal stimulus of one or two trillion. But you have additional taxes of call it uh, 200 billion. So the fiscal stimulus is much more than the, the increase in taxes. The, the real risk from a market perspective is if you have a complete blue wave sweep. In other words, Biden wins, uh, the Democrats gain control of Senate, and the Democrats also have the House, in which case some of the more leftist policies of uh, of the Democrats uh, may actually become law, uh, and which would not be particularly good for markets because that would mean more taxes, more entitlements, uh, more regulations and businesses and all of that. So maybe the gold deluxe or the ideal uh, situation would be if Biden wins, but the, the, the Republicans still have control of the Senate and then the Democrats have control of the House, but then you have more checks and balances and you have a more, shall we call it, central centrist, as opposed to a very left-leaning uh, government going forward. The last thing I'm going to say, Fritz, is I don't think anyone can rule out that Trump will still win, though. You, you know Definitely. That. Yeah. Uh, that was a mistake committed in 2016. Yeah, yes. But around this time, everybody thought that Hillary was the landslide victory, uh, yes, was in yeah. the bag. Uh, yes. But it didn't materialize. Right. Uh, the other topic that I wanted to discuss in a, a, a bit would be what, what we uh, talked about earlier, that uh, a Biden victory would mean a focus on, on, on clean energy, uh, a policy against uh, the oil frackers, maybe, uh, and, and maybe, as he mentioned this morning, a transition to something sustainable in the long term. Um, are there already any bets here in terms of companies, upstarts, that would be potential winners? Well, uh, you can look at renewables. Uh, again, the, I, I highlighted the example of uh, Next Era Energy and Next Era uh, Energy. Uh, and there's, there's two of them, NE and NEP. There's, sev there's several other. Um, like BEV, I think, and then the Solar Edge, which is an Israeli company that makes the inverters that make solar power possible to begin with, and it's like the Intel of uh, of inverters and batteries and all of that. Tesla, 
will clearly be a play on renewables with the battery storage, the solar roofs, and then the electric cars. Um, healthcare will be more, but again, it's so complicated. So in a way, if more focus on healthcare means maybe less profits for the um, a lot of healthcare companies are very profitable. Maybe they make too much money in pharma. No? Um, big pharma generally doesn't like Democrats. Big pharma generally wants Republicans, uh, prefer Republican government. Uh, uh, but no, but I think you will have a lot of fiscal stimulus. Um, the dollar will weaken. Uh, so just keep that in mind, it, it, especially if it's a Democrat sweep. But in any event, be it Trump or be it the US, uh, Biden, I think the U.S. corporates will continue to do well. Uh, the only thing is that I think you will have less chance of a hot war between U.S. and China if you have Biden, because it'll be more reasonable, pragmatic. And now, Trump, would, uh, subside a bit. Trump is not a war kind of president anyway, but he has so many China hardliners in his cabinet. You know, be it Pompeo or. Peter Navarro, et cetera, et cetera. And it's these hardliners that are really golding. They almost want a, you know, some kind of a hot conflict between the US and China in a way. My last question. Yeah. Who would be more beneficial for Asia and ASEAN? Trump well, uh, or, or Biden? If you accept the premise that most Asian countries want to do, want to work well, want to trade well, work well with both the U.S. and China. Most Asian countries want tech and also some military protection from the U.S., but also want to be able to trade and get tech and, uh, you know, Belt and Road, all of that uh, from China. And if you also want to accept the premise now that uh, most Asian countries don't want to have to choose between the U.S. and China, and that most Asian countries won't want hot war in the South China Sea, or in Taiwan, or in Spratly, or blah, 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 Fuga Island, so forth and so on, then, yeah, presumably we are better off with Biden, because presumably Biden would be more of a sit down, listen to, listen to the Chinese, and, uh, but also, lastly, I think with the Biden administration, he will make sure that the allies are aligned and that, that allies are working together and that the combined allies can have a more effective uh, counterweight against China, as opposed to, you know, it's just Pompeo and Peter Navarro with their, you know, their crazy policy sometimes, you know, duking it out with, uh, with, with China. So short answer, I think Biden would be, would be more beneficial for Asia uh, uh, in totality. With that, I'd like to thank you, Roy, for uh, thank you, answering Chris. all my questions candidly. And uh, please sit back uh, for the Q&A at the end of the sure. program. Sure. Marie, back to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Director Roy. We'll see you again later. So, Fitz, uh, thank you for that very engaging discussion. I myself didn't really notice it was already an hour because uh, you actually talked a lot about everything I wanted to hear in this webinar. We <laughs> talked about technology. Sorry to talk about... too much, Marie. No, it's okay. That's actually quite good. So, uh, that's what we all want. We want to know about U.S. equities. We want to know about the U.S. electrons. We want to know more about technology. I myself, honestly, am not very tech savvy. So hearing you and Director Roy talk about it and really make it more human and more, uh, I guess, more relatable, it really helps us a lot now in putting this into perspective. So uh, now, Fritz, uh, I will ask you some questions on how to make all of these ideas and investment themes actionable for our clients. Okay. So our first, uh, my first question actually is, we are all, uh, most of us are Filipino investors, right? And most of us, given that, invest in the peso. We invest in Philippine assets. And when we look at our portfolios, it's actually done quite well. For us in the past decade, we're in, we have uh, Philippine equities doing 51% in the past 10 years. We have Philippine bonds doing 68%. Uh, so that's actually very good returns. So the question is, why do we have to look elsewhere? Why do we have to look outside of the peso and outside of the Philippines to invest? 
that's a very good question, Marie. A and uh, the, the backdrop there on the fixed income side is that the Philippines has always had high yields, high interest rates. In the Asia Pacific region, it's always been the Philippines and Indonesia that has had high interest rates. But because the Philippines got uh, upgraded to investment grade in 2013, and we're now rated A minus in Japan, uh, with higher grades in school <laughs> comes uh, lower fees, <laughs> comes lower <laughs> interest rates, no? Uh, and, and that's why your your bonds uh, rallied by 68% because when interest rates go down, the price of the bonds go up and, and therefore you got 68%. On the other hand, our equity market during the past decade in line with the growth clip of the Philippine economy and higher credit rating also rallied. Uh, and, and we've been very spoiled uh, as, a, as a country because um, by just investing onshore in the Philippines, we got very good returns. But when you look at the Philippines today, as uh, Roy mentioned, globally and locally, interest rates now are at historical lows. Your 30-day uh, time deposit rate is now at 60 basis points or 0.6%. And your 30-day US dollar time deposit is at 0 0.05. Never, never have in our experience uh, seen rates this low. A and therefore what the developed markets had been experiencing for many years now has finally come to the Philippines. That's number one. Uh, second is the concept of diversification. Um, Roy mentioned it earlier several times. I don't know if you picked it up. Uh, but in the world of investments, it's not an all or nothing thing. It's not, do I keep all my cash or do I invest all my cash? And when I decide to invest, do I just buy one security? Let's say a PLDT, I put all my cash in PLDT and, and go back to watch Netflix? Or do I spread it out? Do I diversify my portfolio? And what I'll be hammering home in the next few minutes is diversify, diversify, and diversify. Um, it's not easy. It's a very challenging environment. But just like Roy mentioned, there are other ideas outside of the Philippines that we may want to look at. Okay, good. Before we go into diversification, I'll get back to you on that one. I want to talk about the US dollar, um, mostly because it is actually the first step, as we know, to investing in offshore equities and offshore investments. Um, however, when I look at the performance of the US dollar versus the peso, we see that this year it hasn't been doing very well. So my question is, why is that? Uh, and also, what is your long-term view of the U.S. dollars? And should investors actually use this as an, oppor as an opportunity to buy? Okay, very good questions, Marie. Uh, when you look at it, you're, you're right. The peso today is the best performing currency in the Asia-Pacific region. It's up 4.5% year to date. And the question is why? Why is the peso so strong? Some say the peso is strong because the US dollar is weak. But if that's the, your answer, then look in the region and the Malaysian ringgit, the Thai baht, and the Indonesian rupiah are down four to as much as six and a half percent. And in previous crises, both political and financial crises, uh, the Philippines would be in that basket. Uh, usually uh, tracking the Thai bat. But this time it's different, and it's different because our imports have collapsed. So the Philippines is a major importer. We practically import most of our capital equip equipment, raw materials, and intermediary goods. Together, that accounts for 70% of total imports. And when we shut down the economy, our corporate clients stopped importing. The government stopped importing. And cash 
that was intended to buy US dollars is just in our current savings account right now. In most banks, it's just there. The second reason is our gross international reserves is now at an all time high of 100 billion US dollars. That's good enough for 10 months worth of imports. And together, low imports and high GIR translates into a balance of payment surplus from a deficit. So we have excess supply of foreign exchange, i.e. US dollars in the financial market right now. But guess what? As the government now reopens the economy and it has shifted to MGCQ for most except NCR now, and the target is to move NCR to MGCQ as well by December, as we open up the construction sites, as we open up the malls, as we open up the whole economy, then we will start importing once again. And then the trade deficit will widen again. So short answer is, yes, the peso is an, on an appreciating stance. We're calling for 48 by year end. Uh, if you look at the technicals, it's possible to breach 48 and head towards 4760, okay? But as the imports recover, then naturally there will be more demand for the US dollar to pay for the imports. Mm -hmm. And then the peso will slowly depreciate once again. And, and therefore, if you look probably to the second half of 2021, uh, when the vaccine would theoretically be available in the developed markets, or on to 2022 when it reaches the emerging markets, by then the peso should be on a depreciating mode. Okay, so Fritz, uh, coming back to my question, since uh, as you mentioned, the US dollar's uh, weakness is temporary at this point in time. So would you, would, you, would you say it's a good time to buy dollars right now? Yes, depends who you are and depends what your objectives are. So if your objectives is number one, to diversify your purely peso portfolio of investment in favor of a little in US dollars. Or number two, as Roy mentioned, you're saving up to bring your kids to MBA or to take university in the US, then this is the time to, to accumulate US dollars. This is the buy window, definitely. Uh, because that appreciating peso trend uh, is not there for the long term. It is a short term trade. Okay. Okay, good. Now, actually, coming off from that, uh, well, if I am someone who needs dollars in my portfolio, if I don't have any exposure yet, or if, as you mentioned, I have the need for US dollars, how much do you think uh, my portfolio should be in US dollars or foreign currency in general? Okay. That's a very good question. But when I teach this class, Marie, I always say that's a trick question. Yes. <laughs> because there's no one answer for everyone. Right. For instance, my answer to you, sub 50 years old, <laughs> clearly, right? Yeah, clearly. <laughs> it is different from my, my, uh, my mom who passed away at 88, okay? Uh, or my BPO client whose average population is below 30 years old. Um, but let us assume certain things. Number one, um, you, you, you accept the discussion earlier that there are a lot of ideas outside of the Philippines and you're open to diversify your portfolio, number one. Or number two, uh, you have kids or grandchildren who are about to take university or MBA offshore and you want to diversify, so you buy. Okay, you buy a conservative diversification is up to 20%. Okay, so zero, you, you should look at a 10 to 20% window. Okay, because this diversification uh, doesn't come cheap, doesn't come free. Okay, there are risks involved. Number one, the so called foreign exchange risk. The risk that 
the currency bet could go against you, number one. And number two is, for most of our clients listening today, they have close to zero offshore experience. So my experience tells me always to take it slowly, bite size. Okay. Right? So from zero, let's try 10%. Watch the volatility. When it goes up and you're making money, you're so happy. You'll thank BDO for listening to this webinar today. When, when you're losing money, you'll be cursing me. Okay, so let's let's take it slowly. Okay, uh, and then from ten, you can go twenty percent over time. Right. Okay, so it's a gradual approach to diversification, right? Yep, definitely. Okay, so earlier we talked about um, we talked a lot about equities, a lot of equity ideas, both uh, mostly global, but a lot of our investors might not be completely ready to go equities and might just be sticking to bonds at this time. So my question is for them, right? So if I'm a bond investor, my dilemma is that I'm looking at the options; they're actually very low in yield. So what I do is I keep most of my money in cash, waiting for yields to go up. So right. my question is, how long do you think interest rates will stay low? How long should I wait? Should I even keep waiting? Those are excellent questions. And I will venture a guesstimate okay, <laughs> to guide you and, and our clients listening to us today. When you listen to both the Federal Reserve, the Central Bank of the United States, and our own Banco Central ng Pilipinas, the time frame here for low interest rates is all the way until 2022 to probably 2023. And therefore, we are all looking at a two to three year window time period wherein interest rates will be lower for longer. Take for instance, that the chart that we showed earlier uh, that shows the 10-year fixed rate treasury note, that's how much investors are willing to lend to the Philippine government when they borrow 10 years. Look where it came from in 2005, close to 14%. I don't know if you were still studying, Marie, or if you were working already. So, so I was 14, working already. <laughs> okay, you don't look it. Huh? <laughs> So you're not 50, but you're old enough to remember 2005. Yeah. So when you look at 14% and that 10 year now is at 2.9% and the one year T bill is sub or below 2%. So your question earlier, do I just hold on to cash until rates move up or can I still invest in fixed income today? And my answer is, if you just hold on to cash, you will earn zero. If you put it in time deposit, you earn 0 0.6. But our inflation rate this year is at 2.5 on average. And next year, it will be somewhere between 2.7 to 3.1. And therefore, you will be destroying your wealth. So my answer to your question is, you have to continue investing, but invest in the short. So we are all waiting for rates to move up, but it, it's not going to come in the next 12 months. So invest maybe one and a half all the way to three years. Yeah. If, if you're an individual, your, your retail clients, no? For our institutional clients, we're investing somewhere between two to five years. That's as far as we are willing to, to invest on fixed income today. Clearly, it doesn't make sense to buy the 10-year at, at sub-3%. So you're just 50 basis points ahead of the 2.5% inflation rate. Mm -hmm. By next year, you'd be losing money already. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the answer to your question is we have to continue investing, okay? But pick the duration, pick the tenor of your fixed income instrument. Okay, right. So graduating from that, if let's say, for example, I already picked uh, the right duration of bonds 
And maybe I want to try a little bit of equities, but I'm still a bit iffy about it. My question is, aside from cash, bonds, and equities, is there something in the middle? Are there other options or other asset options, uh, alternatives that I can consider aside from these major asset classes? And you're talking about global investments here, Marie, right? Yes, right. Okay. Let's expand it globally. So when you're looking at global investments, again, look for easy solutions, especially if it's your first time. And so there are such things like multi-asset investments. A fund, just like Roy described earlier, his RYNS fund, it has cash, it has bonds, and it has equities. So there are several multi-asset funds out there, okay? So that's one. Uh, in the Philippines, we'll call that a balance fund. It mm -hmm. has fixed income and equities, okay? To, to keep things simple. Uh, so that's one. And then the second one would be, there are also instruments in the global market that are dividend paying, okay? Some investors like that because it reminds them of the time deposit. Where right. they get something every month or every quarter, they yeah. feel good. Uh, it makes them feel good that they their investment is working for them. Okay. On the other hand, there are investment outlets out there that automatically invest the dividends. Okay. So these are simple ideas, and it, it, it's there. It's both present here in the Philippine market through the so-called feeder funds. Okay, or you may access it through private banking groups uh, or our global partners. So it's all there. It's it's present. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. Okay, that's good to know, Fritz. Because actually, when we talk about global investing, it can be quite uh, intimidating at first, right? But it's good to know we have a lot of other options. Oh, definitely. So when you listen to Roy, <laughs> right? It seems so easy. It oh seems my so God, simple. Why did I think of Google or Apple or Amazon? Correct. Or, or Adobe. It's right in front of my PC every time I, I log on to my PC. Why did I think of that? I use it but, every day. <laughs> but don't be fooled. Roy has been doing this ever since he stepped out of Wharton Business School. That's right. Uh, but if you're talking to your individual cl clients, Marie, none of them probably have had this training to <laughs> stock pick yeah. or have research background or have access to the data uh, even if they have a computer at home. They just don't know how to do it and to analyze it. And therefore, if you don't have the knowledge, then it would be more prudent to rely on investment professionals. That's right, that's right. Okay, so actually my next question is really about, uh, really related to that law as well. So you can pick up maybe more, uh, we can all pick up more investment ideas. What are the specific ways for investors to capture these global opportunities and invest in offshore markets? But I'm going to add a caveat. Um, do we have to go offshore to access these investments? Or can we do it right here in the Philippines? That's a very good question and a very basic question. You know, many, many years ago, when I was beginning my career, uh, and I'd listen uh, to people in CNN or Bloomberg or, or start trading up, back then it was so complicated. And the amounts involved to open an account, you know, was something like five to 10 million yeah. US dollars. Uh, clearly out of my league, uh, maybe closer to your league, Marie, or to Roy's, uh, but definitely out of my league. You know? uh, but today, uh, BDO has made global investing easy, affordable, and convenient. Mm -hmm. uh, why easy? Because you don't literally have to fly to Hong Kong now. Yeah. You can do it here with the various departments inside BDO, mm -hmm. um, number one. Number two, uh, you don't need five to 10 million US dollars anymore to access global investments. Um, our global equity uh, index fund 
uh, wherein we partnered with, with BlackRock, you can invest $1,000 or $2,000. Uh, and I'm sure all our clients listening today have that, uh, if not in their wallet, easily in, in, in their cabinet or in, in their time deposit uh, accounts. Uh, so it's easy, it's affordable, it's very convenient. You can do it through the branches. You can do it through our account officers like you, Marie, and your team. Um, or once you fill up your, your online, uh, you can buy uh, global feeders through online as well. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my simple answer uh, to your question. Should they, how easy is it? It is definitely easier now than 10 to 20 years ago. Okay, so uh, actually I wanted to ask you also, is it better to invest in a global fund immediately for diversification? Or is it advisable for investors to go regional or thematic, in thematic investing right away? Using my own experience, Marie, um, again, we go back to diversification. In your first attempt to go offshore or global investing, you want a simple product. You want something that's easy to do and easy to understand. So I, I go for a, a global diversified fund. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't intend to plug, but we have the BDO Global Equity Index Fund. Okay. Um, Roy mentioned index investing. So it's indexed against the MSCI uh, World Index. Um, the top 10 holdings, just like Roy mentioned earlier, are all familiar names. Uh, Microsoft, Apple, Google, JP Morgan. I mean, all household familiar names. Uh, probably the only unfamiliar name would be Alphabet, which is still Google, right? Um, so go into a, an index fund or go into an exchange traded fund, an ETF that we discussed earlier. It's already diversified, it's cheap, and it gets you initiated into the global investment universe. Uh, that's my first bet, okay? And that's how I did it with my own funds as well when I was learning, okay? And then again, once you get into the rhythm, you see the upside, oh, you feel so good. Ah, oh, it's good I attended the Fritz webinar. Uh, I learned a lot from him and Roy. And then when it dips, you feel so bad. Oh, I'm losing so much money. But at least you get your feet wet, right? Yeah. And then later on, you can get into the thematics, okay? mm -hmm. such as technology, healthcare, uh, these ARC funds that Roy mentioned. Uh, yeah. That's how I do it for my own funds. And that's also how I approach it with my, my clients, both uh, retail and institutional clients. Okay, thank you. Um, supposing I already get my feet wet with an index fund or an ETF, uh, we talked earlier a lot about uh, specific themes, not technology. Marie, Marie, sorry to interrupt. I was yes. corrected here. You can invest as small as 500 US dollars. Oh, invest even better. in our global uh, feeder funds. Even better, Fritz. Thank you. So $500. That's just how much you spend uh, when you go clubbing. <laughs> no, maybe it's in your wallet right now, Fritz. <laughs> 500 so pesos start. I have in my wallet. <laughs> okay, right. So, okay, given that, thanks for the clarification. Um, going forward, no, uh, we, talk, we talked about index investing, ETF investing. Supposing I've done that and I've gotten my feet wet and I want to try some of the specific themes that you and Director Roy talked about earlier, which is technology, ESG, uh, biotech security. What are the ways that I can do that at this time? Uh, and are these long-term themes that we can bet on? Okay, yes. I, I specifically selected these themes because I believe that these themes will be here for the next decade. Mm -hmm. Whether it's technology um, or ESG investing, which is so big uh, in the US and Europe today, uh, or security, whether it's anti-hacking, as I mentioned earlier, or physical security, or ATM security. Uh, 
this will be part of our landscape in the next decade. Um, so the question is, how do I get into this? Uh, as I mentioned earlier, try the vanilla flavor for now, if, if, if it's your first time, and then more sophisticated clients, um, and definitely the size of your investable funds will matter here. Uh, could you just talk to our account officers or our marketing officers, or for you guys at BDO Prime, um, we're definitely there. Uh, our intention this afternoon is just to whet your appetite, to make you aware that these things are there, that it doesn't take five to $10 million to get it. Yeah. For as small as $500 for the simpler products, it's there. Um, and I invited Roy because Roy has uh, become my mentor in, in global investing. Um, and, and we exchange uh, ideas and, and notes almost on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. And uh, I invited him here because I thought that most, if not all of our clients and friends could learn from him as well. Right, right. Actually, uh, one of the things that I personally thought earlier was that, um, you know, being interested in the technology sector as an investment, I was wondering if, if it's better to invest in a pure tech fund uh, or a global fund that has technology exposure. Um, I know the answer, as you always say, will depend on who you're talking to uh, and also the exposure of the clients and the portfolio as well. Uh, but your thoughts on this one, if I'm a novice investor, what should I do first? Again, when you're a novice investor, meaning a first timer, keep things simple. Don't be too greedy. Okay. Tech is great, but you came in late. I mean, it has run up already. So it, it, it's, 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 um, it's easy for it to, to correct anytime soon. Mm -hmm. right? And you could get whipsawed. So getting into a diversified global uh, investment product or even a U.S. fund, U.S. equity fund that already has tech in it, aside from other sectors, I think will be a more diversified portfolio for a novice investor. And then right. later on, you can just increase your, your, your bets on the technology space once mm -hmm. you are more familiar and uh, more acclimatized with, with the gyrations, with the ups and downs of, of global investing. Okay, so basically, if we look at the our options right now, we have global funds, we have US funds, we have multi-asset funds, right? And as you mentioned, if we want to start, we can actually make these uh, for, uh, a part of our core investments. And as we get more sophisticated, that's when we actually start increasing exposure to specific sectors. That's right. Okay, right, got it. So my last question to you, Fritz, uh, my time with you is running out, so I'm going to give you my last question. Now, global investing, as I mentioned, uh, can be very daunting for most of us, no? um, except for you and Director Roy, because of your background and your experience, I'm sure, you know, we made it sound, again, very, very relatable and very easy earlier, but yes, it is not easy and it could be uh, intimidating and we need to put in some safety nets for our clients. Now, my question is, um, how will our investors know the right allocation for their funds, given all of these investment themes, both core and strategic and complementary strategies? How do we know how to uh, allocate our funds? Okay, so when we talk about asset allocation, we start with the peso. I think most, if not all of our clients listening today are peso based. Mm -hmm. And I told you, let's start with 10 to 20% diversification. Start with 10 and then later on move to 20. Okay. So let's talk about 10. Not, not too big, 10%. Mm -hmm. You have a choice now. You can either go a multi asset fund, mm -hmm. just one fund that has cash, bonds, and equities. It's so simple for 10%, right? Or you can split it between fixed income and equities. When you look at fixed income right now, on the 10-year, 0.77% for the 10-year U.S. Treasury, 2.9% mm -hmm. or 3% for the peso fixed rate Treasury note. Right. Not, not so appealing, right? And therefore, you have to go to high-yielding markets. 
So on fixed income, it's not as compelling. But if you look at equities, Philippine equity market has now underperformed global markets, US, Europe, China, for the last year, year to date, last three years and last five years mm -hmm. in US dollars. And so my preference is to put that 10% in global equities. Yeah. Okay. Uh, or multi-asset if you want a diversified portfolio right away. Mm -hmm. And then later on, when you're okay with 10, then slowly build it up to 20%. Okay, All right. Now, thank you very much, Fritz. Uh, again, uh, that ends my portion with you. So we now move on to our Q&A with our audience. May we uh, request Director Roy to come back on screen with us? I'm back. Okay, thank you. All right, so, um, uh, thank you again, uh, both uh, Director Roy and, and, and Fritz for uh, your discussion earlier. I believe we have some questions from our audience already uh, pertaining to a lot of the themes that you spoke about. Um, all right, so if there are any more questions from our audience, please feel free to chat, up, chat us up in, uh, through the chat box on your screen. It's not too late to send in those questions. All right, so my first question I will give to uh, Fritz. Okay. So what do you think of so-called high-yield bonds? Uh, how do they differ from bonds that we mentioned earlier? And uh, how do we invest in these locally? And are they good investments? Okay, uh, high-yield bonds are, are more expensive because if you buy the bond uh, directly and put it in your portfolio, the minimum lots are 200,000 US dollars, okay? Uh, but if you have the size, you have the scale, uh, it's very doable. Again, just talk to your account officers or your marketing officers uh, and they can do it for you. Mm -hmm. a, a, a simpler solution for the retail clients, for our small investors, is just by the uh, US dollar bond fund. Uh, which is invested in, in, in uh, both U.S. dollar Republic of the Philippine bonds and U.S. dollar Philippine corporate bonds. So mm -hmm. let the fund manager uh, diversify that portfolio for you and, and trade it for you. It's simpler. Uh, high yielding markets are, are, are now accessible, um, but it takes a bigger lot to access okay. those directly. Okay, okay. Thank you, Fritz. Uh, the next question, I believe, is for Director Roy. Speaking of tech, what is your view on cryptocurrencies as an investment? And which cryptocurrencies are you most confident in? Um, very complicated question. Um, cryptocurrencies, the problem is that they're not a store of value because the, 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 the value of it fluctuates big time of Bitcoin. So you have, almost like buying a tech stock, you have to you have to you have to understand the fundamentals. Number one, number two, um, some of the central banks themselves are planning to come up with their own digital currency, like PBOC, Bank of England, Fed, and all of that. So they're going to, they're going to be competition. Number three, uh, if you're a U.S. consumer. You can actually buy even like a dollar with Bitcoin now through PayPal or through Square Cash App. I guess it makes the most sense if you're using it to transact. Now, for instance, if you are in the U.S. and you want to send money back to your mom or family in the Philippines, uh, instead of using the remittance channel, you buy some Bitcoin and then you send it uh, directly. But, but in that case, you know, it immediately gets converted to pay, so you have, so you have less risk. Um, th there's some people, I, okay, last point I'll say, there's some people who think that it's like gold, you know, because very low interest rates and central banks printing money, it pays to be in gold. And there are some people who say it pays to be in Bitcoin because there's only so much Bitcoin and it will continue to appreciate given all of the money printing that central banks are doing. But I stay away from Bitcoin myself. I have a little bit of exposure through it, through PayPal and Square, but that's it. <laughs> Okay, thank you, Director Roy. Now, the next question is, uh, I believe, for Fritz. Uh, the Philippine peso broke 48.50 level against the US dollar, and we might see 
the peso weaken, what strategy is the BSP and BAP applying to mitigate inflation? Uh, you know, in inflation is well contained right now. Uh, in inflation is relatively benign. As we mentioned earlier, we, we are looking at an average of about 2.5% inflation this year, mm -hmm. uh, rising to about 2.8 uh, to 3.1% in 2021. Mm -hmm. um, so the Philippines, uh, during the last three administrations, have really learned how to manage uh, inflation. Um, so the, the government's medium-term development program just assumes a 2 to 4% uh, inflation average over a five-year uh, period. So that's not a problem right now. And uh, uh, during a global recession and our own recession, which is the deepest in 35 years, uh, really demand is weak. That's mm -hmm. number one. And then there's no cost push pressure because the price of Dubai crude is down and the price of uh, rice, which is 12% of our CPI, is also down. Um, so inflation is not a problem right now. Okay, right. That's uh, good. Fritz, Fritz and Marie, can I just add something quick on, on, on the peso? Yes, from, yes from go ahead. Go ahead. It's like, uh, you know, in, in the invest com, uh, investment committee that Fritz and I and several other people are, we've all been pushing for a view that the peso will continue to strengthen. No? And it, in fact, it has strengthened. And why has it strengthened? One, because uh, because the because of the, what's the all that the U.S. has done, you know, fiscal stimulus, money printing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The Philippines has done less of that. Uh, in this environment. So no, we've, uh, the Philippine government's been more fiscally prudent and then there's less imports and all of that. However, the second part of my comment is that when things normalize, you know, when COVID becomes a memory as opposed to a <laughs> pandemic and things normalize, generally speaking, when a country other than the US, which is the world's reserve currency, generally speaking, when a country runs a significant current account deficit, generally speaking, the, the country's currency will depreciate. So when things normalize, maybe we'll go back again to the, uh, the pace of gradually depreciating over time. Yeah. Thank you, Director Roy. Actually, that reinforces uh, our discussion uh, with Fritz earlier on the peso strength being quite temporary at this time. So it's a good opportunity to buy dollars. Right. So uh, the next question uh, from our client is that um, we've seen the U.S. stock market moving up as if there is no pandemic. Um, the question is, uh, after the U.S. elections uh, or by any other catalyst, do you see a correction in the U.S. market enough for interested investors to actually come in? Is that a question for Fritz or for me? Oh, for you, I guess, all right. Either Go ahead. <laughs> uh, and, um, let me take my style with it, and Chris, I'm sure you have some stuff to say also on it. Yes. Uh, the equity market is always forward looking, uh, which I mean, some people are say this is crazy. I mean, we're in the middle of pandemic, and the U.S. is COVID central, and why is the U.S. stock market going up big time? The only other market that's gone up even more is China, but China's a bit more understandable. But again, the equity market is forward looking. What is the equity market looking forward to? Equity markets looking forward to vaccines coming in place, the death rate continuing to come down as antivirals or treatment protocols continue to uh, improve. And also the market is looking for fiscal stimulus, no matter what, be it Trump or be it Biden. Again, the main thing that can impact is if you get a blue wave total sweep of Biden winning and then the Democrats uh, gaining control of Senate as well as the House, in which case you may have quite a bit of left leaning, in which case you'll have a one time correction for the, for the S&P 500 and also for tech stocks. I, that's not my view, but uh, I, I may be wrong. I mean, it may actually be a blue wave, uh, but if that's so, then I'll have to adjust the, my holdings as well. I agree with Roy. Uh, for me, when, when I look at global and, and local equity markets, number one, I agree with Roy that equity markets are forward looking in, in the real economy or what we call Main Street. The pain is still there. There are millions that are unemployed. 
there are a lot of SMEs that are struggling, uh, but equity markets are a forward looking mechanism. We're trying to look forward to something that isn't there yet. And, and for me, there are three catalysts. Number one is opening up the economy. And in the Philippines, that declaration just came uh, late last week. And that's why we're on a, on a tear, uh, 500 points in, in less than a week. Uh, number two, uh, vaccine development. And, and last night, uh, the US FDA approved remdesivir uh, as the COVID therapeutic. Uh, in the Philippines, we've been using that for the last couple of months already. And, and, and number three is more stimulus. Uh, so they're pressuring now Nancy Pelosi to agree to the stimulus package. And in the Philippines, we're looking forward to the approval of the 2021 national budget, with, which would be 15% more than the current budget. So these three are, are the catalysts that investors are reacting to. Um, and, and so um, my, my caution there, no, as investors, you always are waiting for the correction. Mm -hmm. But in May, you didn't invest. <laughs> that was the best correction <laughs> in the past decade. <laughs> uh, right, right. Uh, everybody was asking me if it was time to sell. Okay. <laughs> Uh, it was so, go to the bank. It was a uh, right? <laughs> So uh, that was the best correction globally and locally, um, bringing us to bear territory. So for me, uh, and, and this has been my uh, my mantra when I speak in public is make investment a habit. It's not an all or nothing thing. You can do it gradually over time, but keep working on it. Because the markets do not wait for you. They mm. just fly with, with or yeah. without you. They will fly. And, right. and as Roy mentioned earlier for technology, it's the shifting of technology. When we were in business school or in bachelors, uh, there are three, three factors that would shift the output curve. That's labor, capital, or technology. And these days it has been technology. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what uh, Roy has focused on, and uh, with much success at that. Can, I just say, can you imagine if this coronavirus happened in 1995? No Netflix, yep. no yep. smartphones, yep. no Facebook. Yeah, exactly. No we would that's all be going crazy. My, that's right. That's what I tell my cli clients and my own, my own family. Can you imagine what people will do at home without Netflix? Correct, correct. Or how could we meet our clients if there was no Zoom? No Zoom. Yeah. That's right. So the situation <laughs> or, or, or would have been Google Meet or Google Chat, no? Yeah. Uh, so these technologies have really permeated our lives at the household level. Yeah, and and technology improves our living standards. You know, they make the impossible okay. possible. They make us do more with less. Zoom, yep. you know, email, WhatsApp, blah 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 blah. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, I'm going to relate that to the Philippine market, although you mentioned a bit about it, uh, Fritz, already, because I have a question uh, on that. Um, so you mentioned that we've seen uh, an improvement in the Philippine, uh, Philippine Stock Exchange Index, mostly because we had an announcement on the economy opening up a little bit more, right? So the question here is, do we expect the Philippine Stock Exchange Index to continue going up from here? Uh, and do you recommend investing in video equity index fund right now? Um, and also, is the video global emerging market equity index fund a good investment? All very excellent questions, Marie, uh, from our clients. Yeah. Uh, number one is during our last uh, episode last month, uh, our title was gearing up for the recovery, wherein we had uh, representative Stella Kimbo. Uh, talking about the fiscal spending stimulus package. And then my take on that was it's time to invest in equities. Uh, that, that's number one. Number two is what do we buy if you want to buy direct Philippine equities? Then look at the most battered stocks, the, 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 the bottom 10, which are on the banking, property, and conglomerates, plus uh, the casino, Solaire, or, or Bloom. Uh, and, and by no coincidence, since foreign uh, fund managers started buying three days ago, that's where they have been buying. No? 
So uh, you saw uh, the banking stocks, BPI, BDO, Metro Bank, uh, and even Security Bank start to fly. Uh, mm -hmm. Today, you had the Conglos, Ayala Corp, and SM Investments up 3.5%. Uh, closer to 4% already by, by uh, close. Uh, and it's no coincidence because uh, they are badly beaten up, badly battered. And when you reopen the economy, it will be the cyclical counters that will recover first. And the third question is, is the global equity index stock, uh, equity index fund uh, ideal? Uh, I agree. Uh, the reason why we created that fund was for novice investors. When you look at the fact sheet, you'll see that it feeds through an exchange traded fund managed by BlackRock. Uh, it is a very huge uh, target fund, uh, more than 2 billion, I believe, or easily more than 1.5 billion US dollars. Uh, the top 10 holdings are all familiar names, as I mentioned earlier. And when you look at the track record, it really tracks the direction of the MSCI World Index. Um, so it's easy to, to, to monitor. It's, number one, it's easy to buy. <laughs> uh, it's, it's convenient, it's affordable, and then it's easy to monitor. So I would encourage them to really look at that fund. On the equity side, again, if, if you are a novice investor, we have a, uh, a Philippine equity index fund that tracks the PSEI 30 index stocks. Uh, and then the, our largest fund is the, uh, the Philippine equity, the, uh, the BDO equity fund. That's our largest fund. Um, the performance has been quite good. It's diversified. It has index stocks and a few uh, off index bets as well. Okay. But unfortunately, we don't have technology in the Philippines. Oh, yeah, that is unfortunate. <laughs> <laughs> right. So actually, the, the same client sent in a follow-up question. Do you think, uh, what do you think of the BDO Global Emerging Market Equity Index Fund? So Again, that's a very good question. And, and uh, in our asset allocation, the, the core should, should be the Global Equity Index Fund. Uh, and then the second one would, if you want to add more, uh, we're going to launch uh, pretty soon a new U.S. fund that has a little more technology uh, mm -hmm. that has already been approved uh, for launch. Um, and then I'm beginning to look at emerging markets. Uh, why? Again, because they are cheap, they are badly beaten up. Um, and in a re reopening recovery story, uh, if you believe that the U.S. market is already expensive or stretched, then the emerging markets would be cheaper. But emerging markets should not be your core portfolio. It just should be a diversification strategy, you know, if you want a little bit more uh, alpha moving forward. But you have to establish your core, which should be in the largest markets, in the largest companies, um, so that uh, the volatility will not, uh, will not impact you negatively uh, once the, the pullback happens. Okay, thank you, Fritz. My next question is for Director Roy, right? So what is your opinion on the antitrust against Google, Amazon, and similar, similar companies? Uh, and also, what tips do you have for learning to spot healthy and profitable balance sheets? Um. On the antitrust for Google and Amazon, I think there will be some changes, especially if you have a Democrat sweep. But will it change or will it result in the extinction or the, you know, being these companies being chopped up? I don't think so. And the, the simple reason why I don't think so is that at the end of this, these days, those two companies, you know, Amazon and Google, have made so much uh, contribution to making our lives easier. I mean, Americans in particular for Amazon, but you know, Google Maps, Gmail, Google Search. I mean, everybody uses it, and it's for free. Just ha so happens that the revenue model that they chose was an advertising revenue model, as opposed to you know, you and I being charged one hundred dollars per year 
for using all of the Google services. And they could have gone that route, but they decided to go on the advertising route. So yeah, maybe they need to clean up uh, the advertising revenue model to make sure, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, come, come on, like, why would you use Bing for search when there's Google? Mm -hmm. the, I mean, mm -hmm. most tech is winner take most. You, you just use the best and there's no, there's no doubt. Google search, Google Maps, uh, et cetera, is, uh, is best. And if you're in the US, I mean, when we're in the US, we order from Amazon every day. What, what, what else is there aside from Amazon? That okay. is thing also with Amazon is they're now becoming like electricity. Uh, computing, you know, uh, cloud computing. Once upon a time, factories had their own electrical generating capacity, which is kind of weird now. You just buy it from Meralco or from wherever. But computing is becoming more and more like that. You just buy your computing from Amazon or Microsoft or Google. Right, right. So I guess the answer is because their service is unparalleled, something yes. is not likely to dent. Uh, uh, okay. So I. I'm getting a, a, I'm getting an alert that I have limited time with both of you, so I'm going to entertain the last three questions. Okay, so um, where do you see Asian tech equities go? Uh, the likes of Samsung and Taiwan Semiconductor will they mimic the same rise in U.S. equities? Is that, is That's where we're going. Is that for me? Okay. Uh, short answer is yes. There will be more and more opportunities uh, in Asia. Again, unfortunately, there's not much in the Philippines. I wish that there was more software companies or AI or big data companies in the Philippines. But anyway, that's a wish. But uh, going back to the question itself, which is a good question, uh, there's Taiwan Semiconductor. I mean, earlier I talked about the iPhone 11, no, and with eight and a half billion transistors. The chip is made by is designed by Apple, but made by Taiwan Semiconductor. Your future mm -hmm. MacBooks are going to have chips made by Taiwan Semiconductor instead of Intel. Samsung is also a good one, uh, especially if there's a lot more restrictions on Huawei. Samsung is a alternative provider for 5G, for Android uh, smartphones, et cetera, et cetera. But more, but what's even more exciting is the software stuff, the e-commerce, you know, be it. Uh, SEA in Singapore, or Tencent, or Alibaba, or Meituan Jumping, et cetera, et cetera. China is going to be a very, very, very uh, bright tech sector, particularly if you get this iron wall between the U.S. and China. So I would be invested in both U.S. and China. Okay, that's good. That's good. Actually, um, the next question is very much related to that. Um, so we have the U.S. and China as, as investment themes. I have a question here asking if it is already too late to go into the US and or China at this time. And that's going to be my last question to, to both of you. Uh, Chris, do you want to take the first or shall I take the first one? Yeah, go ahead, go ahead, right. Okay, the, uh, I think my, my biggest realization, and I've learned the hard way because I've only been invested in say Amazon since, uh, five years ago, or maybe seven years ago, I should have been invested in Amazon 20 years ago. My wife kept telling me, I sh are you, why, why are you not buying Amazon? And I said, well, it's too expensive. It's too expensive. But I could have said that 20 years ago. I could have said that 10 years ago. I could have said that five years ago. I could have said it one year ago. The real question is, will it continue to grow? Will it continue to get stronger? And for me, at least the answer is yes, for Amazon or Microsoft. Yeah or Google, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, at the end of the day, people like being called what's called value investors. But in a way, with benefit of hindsight, uh, Amazon or Microsoft have been great value investments because you know if you bought it 10 years ago, you were basically buying it at three times or four times this year's earnings. If you just bought it 10 years ago and held it for 10 years, now you're getting you know, three times er or what uh, three times earnings uh, from what you bought it at. So, in in a way, they are actually very good value investments uh, if if they continue to grow. <laughs> okay, I'll take the second question, Marie, um, on, on China. Uh, I I believe that any serious uh, investor has to focus on both the U.S. and China. Uh, simply because they're the two largest economies, the largest importer, the largest exporter. 
Um, if you look at global uh, uh, GDP forecast this year, uh, everybody will experience a global recession except China. Uh, the third quarter numbers just came out uh, and uh, they posted sub 5% GDP growth in, in 3Q. Um, they're first in, in COVID through Wuhan, they're also the first out, the first to open the economy. And I, I believe that uh, we have to seriously now learn and, and monitor uh, the Chinese economy and the Chinese stock market. Again, if you want tech, there are a lot of tech companies from Alibaba to Tencent to Xiaomi. Um, the list goes on and on. And we have a China fund as well that's uh, heavily invested in the new economy in China. So check that out um, and then monitor it first. You don't have to get in right away. Uh, do your homework first. Uh, but uh, that's part of uh, our universe now. And um, we're trying to um, overcome the biases of our clients. No? Many of our clients don't like China, um, mm -hmm. but it's the reality of the next decade that uh, when you look at the next uh, 10 to 20 years, that China uh, is, in a well, uh, is in a position to, to become a, a, a global power uh, in, 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 and uh, eclipse the strength of the U.S. economy. May, may I just quickly add to that and say two things. Number one, in many of the themes that I highlighted earlier, like digitalization of cash, digitalization of work processes and all of that. China is actually ahead of the U.S., you know, at Tencent, uh, Alibaba and Financial, which is about to IPO. They're well ahead of their U.S. counterparts, uh, number one. And then number two, if you look at average education levels and especially STEM, you know, science, technology, your average or median Chinese is well above uh, that of America, American average median. So, you know, if if it's quality of education that well, that matters, you know, China has an edge. Okay, thank you so much, Fritz and Director Roy, uh, for uh, answering our questions and giving us your insights. Unfortunately, that's all the time that we have for today. Uh, now, for our dear clients, if you have any questions that we didn't get to tackle today, please feel free to still send them through email, uh, through email at videoinvest at video.com.ph with market sense in the subject line. Alternatively, you can also share your questions with your respective relationship managers, and we, we uh, will all be happy to uh, actually assist you. Now, you. Um, we would also like to request uh, that after this event, you will see a pop up uh, screen uh, with a link to a survey to this event. Now, we would really appreciate it if uh, uh, everyone who participated would answer the survey. This is to give us a view on how we have done so far, what topics you would like us to cover uh, in the next webinars, as well as really how we can improve this uh, experience for you moving forward. Right. So um, now before I close this event, i just like to recall everything. Uh, 2020, again, has been a very remarkable year for many, uh, many reasons. But as we've seen and heard in today's webinar, there are a lot of bright spots, uh, a lot of opportunities that we can still take advantage of. And in fact, a lot of those opportunities were born out of this kind of uncertainty and adversity in the market. So here uh, in BDO, we are always here to actually guide you and see and help you see and spot those opportunities and seize them as well. All right. So on, thank you very much again uh, on behalf of BDO Unibank. Uh, we'd like to thank all of those who joined us this afternoon. This is Marie Claustro and this has been Market Sense. <laughs>